Hi, I'm Ruth Samalo, Features Programmer at DocNYC, and it's my pleasure to be speaking today with the team behind the documentary Billie Eilish, The World's a Little Blurry, brought to us by Apple TV+. We have with us director, writer, producer, RJ Cutler, cinematographer, Jenna Rosher, and editors, Greg Finton and Lindsay Odstein. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being with me. Hello. Hi. 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 Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Um, I absolutely love this film. Um, I, I wasn't so, um, so I didn't know so much of the Billy story, um, but this is such a great example of like the beauty of like modern cinema verite observational documentary, which sometimes we forget that is like kind of like the father form of documentary in America. And um, I love how you've all worked together in this film to, to bring us through this like roller coaster of activities and emotions with Billy and her family. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit, because a lot of the audience of our, of our members are filmmakers themselves. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the production design. Like, how do you go about, you know, making a film that is like a year long and it has like involves like a, a, a small crew, I presume, I don't know, filming with Billy, Jenna, you can tell us about that. Perhaps like uh, talking to them about filming themselves and giving you footage. You know, when did you started seeing the rushes, Greg and Lindsay, like in terms of editing? How did you all collaborate it to build this film? Shall we all speak at once and answer <laughs> those questions? <laughs> I'll start. I'll start and pass it around. Well, well uh, um, uh, I, I I believe that that everybody, uh, all all three of my collaborators were on the film from the from the beginning. Uh, if I'm missing it by a, a month or two, uh, that that might be the case. But but we we knew that though we wouldn't start editing until about eighty percent of the way through the process. That um, that that uh, th that these guys were going to be aware of what was going on and were and that they were going to be working together. We understood that from the beginning. And there's actually a missing person in the dynamic of how what you're asking, the answer to the question you're asking, how does it all work, which, which is uh, um, uh, Jonathan uh, Ruane, who is our co-producer and kind of the, the, the one person uh, who, who watched every single frame of footage that not only we shot, but was that it, it, uh, as well, but also that was accessible to us, which is to say all of the family shot footage, all of the stuff that we got off of uh, Maggie, Billy's mom's iPhone, all of the, uh, the GoPro stuff from the kid's bedroom, because there were a lot of sources in this, and you're right, it is modern. I've, I've been saying it's a little kind of a, a neo-verite, and then it's verite, uh, that that is it was shot by Jenna uh, um, in the field uh, with Billy and her family in in the in the great tradition of the cinema de verite shooting. But there's also because we all live with cameras in our pockets, and because uh, Billy's uh, mom is a natural born documentarian, uh, mm -hmm. there's there's tons of footage. And Billy herself, as we know, is a bit of a filmmaker. Uh, there's tons of footage that they shot. So all of this had to be kind of acquired and accumulated. And uh, Jonathan Ruane, who we call J. Ru, was uh, was 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 eyeballing all of it. And and he and I were periodically meeting and. Um, and and so that and then when when uh, about a month or two before we wrapped, uh, uh, Greg and Lindsay started uh, um, cutting. Um, the, the Jonathan was instrumental in kind of the transition from the the field process to the post process. Um, uh, I'll, I'll let Jenna speak to what what shooting in the field was like, but it was it was very. I'll, I'll say that it was incredibly intimate. It was very. Um, uh, it was it was pure verite. There were you know two or three of us uh, at the most. There were never any lights. There was, a, you know, our, our our objective at all times is to impact the environment we're in as minimally as possible. And we did, and, and so we did that, and and to see things as clearly as possible, purely observationally. I mean, we're you know we're real people in a room. We uh, we always kind of reject this notion of flies on a wall because uh, I'm no fly, as you can see. Jenna's no fly, and she's got a camera. Uh, 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 Jay, our sound recordist, who also uh, is a key part of the the process.
from the success of the film. Uh, has a boom mic, um, so he's no fly. Um, uh, he may be part fly, but um, but he uh, uh, but but it's um, uh, uh, it's a it's a tiny presence. Uh, but it's a tinier house. <laughs> so uh, so anyway, I, 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 those are the those are the broad strokes. Uh, uh, Jenna, what, what, take it away. You know, I think I mean technically, yeah, it was small crew um, and not wanting to have much of a footprint at all. And I think you know, coming from the emotional side of it was really like coming in with as much humility and compassion and patience as possible. You know, because here we are. Hi, we're here. We're going to start capturing every moment of your day. How do you feel about that? You know, so it was always being super respectful. And these aren't, you know, these aren't, this is an amazing family to immerse yourself in. Um, so there was right from, right from the get go was just, I think, a, 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 a mutual respect between our very small crew and the family and Billy's team. Um, something really interesting about shooting with her early on was that I have a tendency when I first film people to kind of be on a long lens and stay in a corner and kind of just keep back a little bit. I don't want to be ever present in their every moment. I want to kind of just be in the background a little bit. They know I'm there, but not be in their face. And the feedback, remember RJ early on was like, no, Billy wants you really close to her actually. <laughs> like, and I said, oh, oh, okay, that's that's awesome. She wants to be able to, to make eye contact with a camera, have moments where she feels that she could look at that camera and kind of you know, uh, validate like what she was going through in a moment. You see evidence of that in the film where she'll make eye contact with the lens. And for me, that's like a moment where she's connecting to her fans, to her audience and being like, yeah, this is happening right now. Isn't it crazy? You know, so the, um, yeah, when, we, when, first. when we first, when I, I first met with Billy, the, 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 you know, it was very clear to me that this was going to be a family story and this was an opportunity to make a film that was, simultaneously a, a coming of age of a, of a remarkable artist, but also the coming of age of a remarkable young woman. And that, that, that we could kind of pursue those dual narrative tracks in the, in the making of the film. And that, that held too throughout the entire process and the film that, that, that you watched. Um, and, but I, 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 in that first conversation, I said to Billy, have you, has, have you thought about what this might be like? And she said, uh, yeah, I wish it, I'd like it to be like The Office, uh, which is, as we know, a faux documentary and a scripted show. And I was like, I wonder if she knows it's a faux documentary and a scripted show. But of course she did. And what she really meant when she said that was, do you know, in, in The Office, every once in a while, John, the John Krasinski character will glance over to the camera and make a connection to the audience, break down that fourth wall and she wanted as jenna says that opportunity to be able to connect to the audience which is of course so billy eilish because she has this unique relationship with her audience and we didn't use it a lot maybe two or three times in the edit but when we do use it it's key moments it's uh it's uh, the, 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 a moment where she's with her boyfriend and, and things are going well and she, she looks at us. And, and, and yeah, as Jenna says, it's, it's her way of saying, I, I'm here and you're here and we know each other's here and let's see what happens next or come along with me in that very uh, Billy Eilish way. Um, Lindsay and Greg, what was, the, what was the kind of entry point like for, 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 for you guys? Gosh, yeah. I mean, remember, Lindsay, we we had the pleasure of just spending the first three or four weeks together, just simply screening together. And it was just uh, Lindsay and I, for the most part, just sitting in a room watching this stuff for 10 hours a day. And uh, remember, at the end of every day, Lindsay, we would say, I've never laughed so hard uh, <laughs> at material, never like felt so emotional. I, I'm, I, honestly remember getting teared up at, at the raw dailies in, in a number of different places. And I never laughed as much as, as we did when we just screened the raw footage of this. And she was so unbelievably charming, right? Yeah, we, I remember we said a couple times that we'd never had so much fun screening raw footage before. Right, right. Um, so we had great material to work with and, you know, you can't, emphasize how important that is, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think to what Greg is saying, for me at least when I'm screening material, I like to really take note 
of how I felt when I watched it for the first time, because mm -hmm. that is the experience that you're handing to the audience. And so when I'm taking screening notes as I'm watching, I'm, I often write like how it made me feel or what emo emotion I felt. It's not, it's less about like jotting down the story points because we can always access the logs and things like that. It's more just mm -hmm. trying to remember how it affected me when I watched it. And I think, um, I hold on to that throughout the entire process of editing, even when we get further along where, you know, things are getting, you know, we have to make really difficult decisions about what stays and what goes. I try to, you know, conjure those early feelings of screening and, and, and what it meant, because at that point in the process, you, you're so sick of seeing it. You've seen it so many times <laughs> right. that it's easy to forget how it felt when you first saw it. So I think it's an important, um, you know, discipline to have to remember those moments. And I think, uh, you know, just to speak to what Jenna and RJ were saying about Verite and the nature of Verite, like, you know, I see my job when I'm cutting Verite and I think Greg, you know, I don't wanna speak for Greg, but I, I, I know he, I think he feels the same way is, is to try to really somehow um, preserve that rawness, that kind of, uh, experience of watching something like, you know, I don't feel like I need to be in the room. I don't need to announce my presence as an editor to the audience in any way. My job is to get out of the way so that we can elevate this material uh, to an audience and they have the same experience that we had kind of watching it. And so, you know, oftentimes those are the, the types of edits that you can't see as well you know it's not flashy it's not super fast you know obviously we have sequences where things are cut fast and you know we tried to mix up the pace throughout the film but in a lot of these scenes you know our job is to try to make those edits as invisible as possible so that you are getting that kind of raw experience um and that's not always easy to to hide those edits but um we you know i think that's we did that a lot throughout the film is to try to really translate this experience in a way that felt authentic and raw something they, that they, i'm, they, I'm they, glad I'm, oh. i just want to say that i'm really glad that you brought up the um you know the kind of very day uh, versus the breaking the fourth wall because i think no no modern very day will be completely ethical without a slight acknowledgement that the characters are aware of what's going on around them because it's very different like i know rj you're a big fan of like the Maisel's brothers you know and and uh you know the early fathers of cinema and dia penny baker you know at the time that they were making films um people were not so self-aware and about their images and about their representations in cinema so i think like today it's a you know it's like a theoretical interesting point that how can you make a, a truly honest very dead film today without slight acknowledgement that the characters know that you're there right yeah, yeah we're 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 there we're there this is again why i i kind of reject this notion of fly on the wall we're present we have a relationship with our subjects um uh, uh you know billy and and maggie and patrick and phineas and everybody around us are are people who are they're part of our lives and we're part of their lives for a year of filming and we so we don't you know what we're not doing is i mean it doesn't matter what we're not doing what we are doing is being present with them and observing and and you know i always uh it's I, I I use the Wayne Gretzky story as my as my model the story of the, the the great hockey player who was was asked what his secret was and said uh, it's very simple I just follow the puck uh, you know everybody else on the skating rink is trying to get the puck to do what they want it to do Gretzky's looking somehow feeling where the puck wants to go and that's the same for us where is the where is life going. What are we seeing happen before us? No expectations. We always say directing in, in these films is, is what you do in the bar at the end of the day, where you say just what Lindsay and Greg are talking about. You say to each other, what did you experience today when you were observing? Jenna, what did you experience through the, through the camera? Jay, what did you hear? RJ, what did you experience watching and listening and interfacing with everybody? And that's where we collect our sense of what we have seen, what we might see next, and that evolves. And similarly, in post-production, what did you 
guys see in the footage? What was your emotional experience? What do we feel the narrative is? What shape does it have? Where does it, what are the key moments? And I, I, I bet you that what we noted in those first four weeks where we were reviewing all the footage and having those conversations pretty much every day, that that film, the film we talked about then and the film we ended up with were pretty much the same thing. It's not, we found our structure very early. We, you know, of course there were trouble points and things you had to work on. And, but following that sense, following the puck of Billy's life, we were able not only to film what we filmed, but then to edit that film into the film that you saw. And, and, um, and the vision was pretty unified because of that constant communication um, and reliance on our own, uh, our own sense of the truth of what was happening. One of, my, one of my favorite things about the film is how you show how pretty much everything emanates from Billy's and from her creativity and talent and, and Phineas also. But and you show us um, almost through like a magical object, which for me is that little diary notebook of Billy, where you get the monsters under the bed, you know, the teenage anxieties, her brilliant lyrics, you know, the ideas behind the music video concepts. And all of that creative process, which is, you know, really hard to capture in cinema because it's often invisible. You kind of like give us that journey into the whole creative process from like an idea to like a hyper professional production and then to massive success. So tell us a little bit about capturing the muses and these correlations between like her songs and her life. Well, the, the notebook is, uh, she's, it's a, this important totem for her. And, and you, you, you're right to identify it as kind of an anchor. It's, it's, it, it, its presence is in the first scene of the film. And, and then there's payoff in one of the closing scenes of the film where she kind of answers the, the riddle and, and, and it opens itself up to her whole, all of the struggles of her early, early adolescence, the suicidal ideation, the depression, the, the, all of those things which then bring us into her bedroom where we see the wall. It's a, it's, there's a deep connection, but it's also, as you say, the source of so much of her inspiration. And I remember, you know, and, and, and a lot of that footage was captured um, the early footage was captured by cameras before we were there. It was, but you know, it was whether it was on the GoPro or there was one day where there was a crew just filming for posterity before we even arrived. So we had that footage. And I remember uh, uh, Greg and Lindsay, when you first screened that material and we're like, holy moly, that's uh, that the, the guts, the guts are all there. And, um, and again, it's not, <laughs> perhaps because the director was constantly bellowing, don't change a frame, but the <laughs> earliest cuts of that, <laughs> of that material pretty much sustained. You know, Lindsay kept on saying, there were so many times where Lindsay would say to me, can I just do a second pass on the, <laughs> on the notebook scene? Because as you say, it was so, it was so shockingly brilliant. And so it tapped into something so deep that is, you know, hard to come by. And I, I was say one thing about uh, the notebook stuff as well is that every, whenever we tried to sort of make it a little bit more than what it really was or a little bit off of what it, it, it the film kind of rejected it a little bit. It, it, you know, we had to find our groove with, with using that, that notebook particularly. And it was really fascinating to, to the more we let it be what it really was for her and just sort of us, us as editors and filmmakers staying out of the way of that and not trying to impose some other big meaning upon it and just letting letting it be what it really meant to Billy, the, the more the film embraced that. You know, it was it was a real, it was a real, that was probably one of our bigger uh, wrestling matches, uh, I'd say with the editing, wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it sounds so, I mean, it sounds cliche to say this, but uh, the film really does tell you what it wants to be and that we really had that experience mm -hmm. cutting this anytime we tried to force it to be yep. something it wasn't mm -hmm. we could all see that's not working you know and we would kind of go back to the drawing board and 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 ultimately what I think we ended up with is a film that feels really like Billy like really you know homemade and and authentic and um and you know not too 
not to like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, glitzy, not to, you know, smooth around the edges. And I think we wanted it to feel, you know, kind of raw, so. I was gonna add to it, just even in, in capturing it, that the timing in which she was feeling open and comfortable enough with us to sit mm -hmm. at that table and mm -hmm. talk to us about a lot of the darkness that lived in that book, you know? That didn't happen, obviously, in the first three months. It happened down the road. And then when she was willing to show us her wall, which is actually another sacred side of the book that she often keeps covered, um, because I think there's part of it, it's a record. It's a, it's a record of what she's been through. And there's, there's kind of like war sort of scars from it that she doesn't necessarily want to erase because it's, it's part of who she is. But it took time for uh, us to develop a trust enough for her to say, I'm going to show this. I'm going to lift the fabric literally and show you what this is. And Jenna, and to, to, to that extent of like um, working out the relationship enough with her and her family to allow mm -hmm. for those you know, very beautiful and intense coming of age moments, you know, like her heart breaking because her boyfriend's not calling or like, you know, going to see her, like her, her unbridled love for, you know, from Justin Bieber mm -hmm. and like what it meant for her to meet him in person and have his support. Like th there's so many beautiful human candid moments and, and she's such an amazing, you know, self-aware and mindful and very wise character that it's just great to also be able to have those moments where she's a little bit more candid or more of a child also, like we all are. Um, tell us a little bit about um, how, how, how did you, um, or what was the agreement? Like, was there, was there an agreement? Like, if she's not comfortable with something, you will reconsider it. I know, RJ, that you had Final Cut on everything you do, but like, were there conversations about, you know, her feeling comfortable with certain things that were going on? Well, Billy's a remarkable subject for a verite film and that uh, her, you know, I don't know that she was ever uncomfortable, but we're, but you know, everybody's human. Everybody, you know, I always say, and I don't know that I would ever need to say this to Jenna, but, uh, but I always say to the crew, you know, let's, let's, let's stop shooting 10 minutes before they ask us to stop shooting. You know, you don't want to be filming people who don't want to be filmed and you don't want them and you want them to be happy to see you the, the next day when you come back or the next month when you come back, whenever it is, you know, this, so, so it's not, I mean, our agreement was that we would film and we would use the footage and that was that and, and yes, indeed, I had final cut and all of that. Um, but, but, it, but this all gets to the question of the, of the a concept that Jenna brought up, which is trust, which is all that it, that's the agreement. And trust is not something that you uh, you you know that you have in a in a in a contract. It's it's a dynamic. It's a relationship. A, a Billy and her family trust us because we're trustworthy, which is to say we are who we say we are. And we show up when we said we at well, the day we met them that there were going to be three of us and no more. And I was going to make myself as scarce as possible. Sometimes there'd be two, you know, in the room and I'd be out in the hallway. And then when we did it, they were like, oh, they're, and we said, we'll try to leave 10 minutes before you ask us to leave. And so when we did it, they, you know, everything you trust, you don't earn trust on a Monday and not have to earn it again on a Tuesday. You do it every day and you are who you say you are and you're real and you connect and you trust each other. Um, we're trusting them to be themselves, you know, and uh, and all of this, and that's what you have, and that's how the movie gets made, and that's the agreement. Because if that is broken, verite doesn't work, and um, and so uh, you know, Jenny, you, you can speak to it as well. Um, yeah, I think you know, I think knowing social cues is really important. I knowing when to take a break walk away, go check in on mom in the kitchen, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of that, but they were such a welcoming family and they're such an open family. I never felt like there was a moment we were ever, you know, that Billy was, she actually just, I think, loved having us there. And I think she just carried on the way she would carry on any other day. That was just who she is, the rawness and, and realness of Billy was, was every silly kind of fortunate because I've been on projects where it's, it's a little more tricky and you really have to constantly be navigating this sort of maze of humanity. Um, 
And so I think, you know, Billy saw me as a friend. She kind of probably saw me as a little bit of a mom, a big sister at times. Um, I knew kind of when to probe a question or RJ knew when we would, if there was, we didn't really obviously talk to her that much, but there was some moments where we get a little clarity. And but for the most part, I think she was delighted to have people observing her world, you know? Um, and then, and there's some, there, yeah. And there are times where you do things just so that you can do them together. You never, you don't imagine that the footage there. I remember once Billy wanted to practice driving, but Maggie had to be somewhere and Patrick wasn't, she didn't want to go with Patrick and, and I, but she needed an adult in the car. And we were like, I was like, I'll be the adult. I'll give you a driving lesson. And in, in that gave us a chance to be with Billy alone. And they, we never imagined the footage would get used though. Goodness knows we tried to use those scenes. Uh, <laughs> in the 24 hour cut. Because, <laughs> exactly because we she went on a little driving adventure and and you know it was it was awesome but more than anything that afternoon we bonded in a in a special way plus we helped them solve a problem which was billy wanted a driving lesson needed an adult in the car so it's just like and there are 70 versions of that that i i could tell you about it's it's all about an ongoing organic fluid dynamic of um, of connecting as and and being real, and uh, Jenna points out the the, the 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 interview process for this, which we don't do, we also do do. You know, it's that sense of when we will know. Hey, Patrick, what's going on? As Billy drives off the day she gets her license, and then he speaks to us, and he speaks to us as he would to someone with whom he has a trusting relationship. And, and that is because we have spent months and months developing that trusting relationship. And of course, when he speaks to us, he bears his soul in as powerful a scene as the movie has. There's some amazing scenes, but another thing that I wanted to um, quickly ask you about, Greg and Lindsay and, well, everyone, it's um, because it's also a musical. I mean, this film is so, so layered. It has so many narratives, but you do music not only not only the musical timeline of her career and her creative process, but also you use music as an as like an emotional narrator when there's no voiceover, but there's like very intentional music in the edit. Like for example, right before the intermission, you know, when, when she's a little bit heartbroken and she goes into the bus, it's such a brilliant use of music all there and um, and after that. So I wonder like, how did you, how did you um, figure out how to make that music a character also? I think that that was exactly it, was that we we had many discussions uh, right in the beginning that the music w had to be a character because the music is the reason we were all here to begin with, right? So I, I don't think there was any world in which the music wasn't going to be a character uh, in this film. And, um, you know, I, we all love working on, you know, with music and, and you know, on music films in general. and. and um, her her music is just it, it, her, you know she she speaks more to me she speaks more uh, lyrically almost than she does just in her her day to day life and that that's where her real heart and her real essence comes through so um, I don't know for for me I remember Lindsay I, I, oftentimes the songs just sort of naturally we 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 certainly maybe we had two or three options of songs we would use in that in a particular pocket. But it was always pretty clear as to well, there was you know. there was one concert which shall go unnamed, which <laughs> did live in a forty-five minute version of itself for a very long time. Very long because time we, because we could not decide which songs to use because we loved them all. Um, so we just lived with a forty-five minute concert in the middle of the the rough cut for a long time. Um, but you know, but to great like, joy, to great delight, to, to great joy, and sometimes uh, a little, a little less uh, joy. You know, less joy. But, but uh, go ahead. Sometimes the editors want to make some moves, and sometimes the directors aren't ready. And that just happens. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, you can't understand Billie Eilish without understanding her music and the appeal that her music has to, um, you know, to her, her fans. And so it was a critical piece for all of us from the beginning, but how we were gonna weave it in remained, a, you know, a 
difficult uh, until we, you know, got further and further down the road. I mean, we we loved all the songs, we loved everything, but eventually you have to be disciplined about what song goes where and does it feel like it's organically growing out of this scene that we just saw and is it a good lead into what we're about to see and that's just trial and error that's just you know a lot of time letting this stuff kind of uh, uh you know bake in the edit and then seeing how it feels but i will i do want to tell a story about when we discovered what is now the opening scene of the film um which which was uh, you know, some of the footage we inherited, and that was one of the scenes we inherited. And it's uh, before Billy really writes her debut album, but she had been on the road for years. And she's at this incredible moment in her career, you know, where she's got a fan base, but she's still not super, super famous yet. Um, and there, and I remember when I came across that footage, just the feeling of like, wow, this is capturing a mega star in that really vulnerable place like right before she crossed at one point Maggie described it as going through the door you know like you go from being on one side of the music industry to the other and you know she was only 16 years old during this concert all of her fans were singing along and it was just such an incredible scene and I remember uh, cutting a few of the songs and then showing RJ and I hope you don't get mad at me for telling this RJ <laughs> but he cried and um, I think we both- Not mad at all, I'm gonna cry right now. <laughs> I think we both cried because we both felt that feeling of this is a special thing that was captured of this person at this moment in their lives. And this music is so beautiful. And look at these fans singing along and look at how they feel every word of what she says. And that, you know, became, it. you know, we were like, this has got to open the film and it, it always did and it never moved that was and, one and, thing and, and, we, it and, was always and, and, the beginning of the rough cut it was the beginning of the assembly yeah. and it's the beginning of the film now it never you know left. and woe woe to those who might have suggested that that scene moves. yeah it was not pretty it was not pretty for those I, any I, any I, I cried for different reasons. Yeah, so. <laughs> we found, we found, um, yes, we found its heart and soul in that, in that very, and to find it in your opening scene, and to, you know, we thought of it really as a prayer in a way, as an incantation, as a. There are a lot of theatrical notions here of gathering the audience, of of getting them to a point where they can go on a journey, and of taking them on a journey, and we talked about that frequently. But as you point out, we also talked about it as a musical all the time. And the great gift um, of, of the music in this film is that not only did we have all those songs to work with and all those beautiful performances, and I'm eager to have Jenna talk about shooting the performances, but we also had the, 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 the stems, the, the music that Phineas and Billy wrote and that Phineas produced in its purest forms. And we could strip back and, and uh, Greg and Lindsay, among their million genius talents, <laughs> was working with those, with those elements. And in, in the sequence you're talking about, where um, uh, uh, you're talking about the end of what is the, the first half of the film before intermission, but then right after intermission, there's also a sequence that's played where, where the music scores, where the stems score. So before intermission, there's the, the darkness of the disappointment that is so powerfully musically that Lindsay, it was, I'm sure it was trial and error, but it was the first thing I heard was that version. And I remember when you sent it to me and, and you were like, I think it's pretty bold when I'm trying, but I think it works. And it was incredible. And also it told us again, the film told us in that moment, I need an intermission here. You know, Billy's gonna go to sleep and see what her life's like on the other side of this. Let's all take a very quick seven or eight second nap, but if you wanna hit pause, you can, or whatever it is, <laughs> but let's take a breath here. And then on the other side, and what's the first thing that happens on the other side of that is her, you know, her hero, Justin Bieber, descends from the heavens, <laughs> sends her a song that he has recorded, her song that he has added his vo vocal to, and then she meets him. And Greg so beautifully captured that moment 
with a song that we probably wouldn't have used otherwise because it was a, 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 a song that she'd written for an Apple ad and, and, and he just used the stems from it. And when she, she's hugging Justin, all the audio fades away and there's just come out and play, it's called, right? Yep. And there's yep. Just come out and play, yep. it's so beautiful, it's so perfect. So they, there was really a collaboration going on between us, the filmmakers and Phineas and Billy's music that uh, you know you couldn't have predicted, but we we sensed that resource and it it rhymed so much with our desire to create a musical. But then there was also the shooting of the performances, which uh, to me does harken back to a film like Gimme Shelter or a film like Don't Look Back, where you're so intimately involved in the perform with the performer in a way. Even being present, I think, in the concert hall, you wouldn't be. And Jenna just nailed it so perfectly so maybe you can speak about that process you all nailed it but we're gonna have to leave it here I'm oh so no sorry. we're over time a little bit but um oh, okay. it's been such a pleasure talking to you all thank you for sharing your wisdom with us and this beautiful film thank you thank Gaga. you thank you